Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 97,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM members. I'm Stephen Igaraki, co-chair of the ACM Practitioner Board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. You can find more info on my background and the bio widget on your screen. For those who may be unfamiliar with the ACM or what it has to offer, here's more information. ACM offers educational professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM learning resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing and driving the innovations to sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including the communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, and support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize and Computing Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technologies that enrich our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can close or relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the volume on your computer. The session is being recorded and will be archived and you'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check webinar.acm.org and learning.acm.org for updates on this and upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the menu dock at the bottom of your screen. You can use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments using the hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching your tweets. We also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast. Today's presentation is Algorand, a better distributed ledger by Sylvia McKelly. Sylvia McKelly received his Laurea Mathematics from the University of Rome and his PhD in Computing Science from the University of California, Berkeley. Since 1983, he has been on the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing Science Department at MIT. Sylvia's research interests are cryptography, zero knowledge, pseudo random generation, secure protocols, mechanism design, and distributed ledgers. Sylvia is the recipient of the Turing Award in Computing Science, the Godel Prize in Theoretical Computing Science, and the RSA Prize in Cryptography. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Academia de Linche. Sylvia, without further ado, I pass it to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Algorand. Algorand is a new distributed ledger. So let me tell you what a distributed ledger is. Think of it like a, 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 new, a newspaper of the world in which you know, all the information is organized in pages. One page, say, every minute or so. And um, generalizing is actually a sequence of data organized in blocks. So there they are, data block one, data block k. Satisfying three main properties. The first one is that you know, these blocks ought to be readable by everybody. The second one, and this we are going to exemplify, is by taking these data blocks and moving them up to the sky so that everybody, the crowd, the humanity downstairs can actually look up and see what the data blocks are. The second property is that anybody should be able to write in these blocks. So you see that person in the crowd there, he wants to write something on the block, that, that item is going to appear, say, in the next block. And the third property is that all this information is actually secured and tamper-proof. Nobody can erase it, and nobody can alter it in any way. 
how do we signify this by putting them in a, actually in a chain of bulletproof transparent glass in the sky. So that's of course is a metaphor. So everybody can read, everybody can write, nobody can change. Essentially the distributed ledger is good for a lot of things with these properties. It's, First of all, notarization and storage. So you want to timestamp something, you put it on the ledger. And that is actually a transparent notarization and storage for the entire world. It's going to put us uh, in a, a common knowledge and harmony for everybody. Second of all, it, it linearizes all this uh, transaction, all this information in a very time sensitive sequence so you can see what preceded what. Second of all, it's like having a a common trusted party, that is not something that I'm going to dwell in this particular um, seminar, but um, um, what do I mean by this? So, uh, assume you, you and I want to uh, digitally sign a contract simultaneously. It is very hard to see who should sign before the other, because whoever signs first is a little bit at a disadvantage, is already committed to the, uh, the, con uh, the contract, but not yet the other. If you have a distributed ledger, you can do very simple things like I, Silvio, am obligated to this contract if and only if my signature and your signatures are going to appear together in the next block or say in block 151. So a minute later, I look up in the sky, if my signature and your signature are there, we are both committed. If my signature only appears there, I'm not committed. Why? Because everybody sees the same block that I see, and therefore everybody sees that my, your signature is missing, and so on and so forth. So to have a common trusted party for endowing humanity with a common trusted party is no small advantage. It can be used for payments and cryptocurrencies as well. And by the way, payments is very clear because it's very clear who pays what to whom, so it's very clear how much money is left for everybody to spend. But by the way, why not say that he cures the common cold? Here is the guy very unhappy as the cold. Somehow he goes to the ledger, his health is restored and comes back. Bottom line, the distributed ledger is a dream infrastructure. On this, we all agree. The only question that we have in front of us today is how to best implement it. And there are actually two approaches. Bitcoins and derivatives is a one particular architecture, and I'd like to focus on the new architecture that I'm proposing to you, Algorand. By the way, you'd be happy to know that both architecture really use some of the most mature cryptographic technology, essentially digital signatures and uh, uh, random oracle hash functions, hash functions to compress data so that the compressed data is, uh, as, uh, is, is as good uh, as a, a, a random number, essentially. All right, so let me remind you about uh, Bitcoin, and again, uh, this, is a pro this approach is shared by many other uh, cryptocurrencies right now. Bitcoin is based on eventual consensus and proof of work. One at a time. Proof of work. Well, proof of work is a lot of work. So that is uh, signified by this miner who is going to excavate a tunnel. And so the system starts somehow with you know, uh, one block, but somehow is the original block, so-called the genesis block very often. This is really uh, part of the description of the system. Everybody knows this. The whole point is what is the next block and the one after that. And for this Bitcoin, creates a work which is essentially to solve a cryptographic riddle which is so hard that one winner of a reader, one solver of a reader will be expected to exist every 10 minutes no matter how many people on earth try to solve it. So start working and if you solve a riddle you have a right to publish a block so work, 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 enough for now. Let's have a look. First of all, what has happened, which is actually intrinsic in this uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, thing, you don't have a chain of blocks, you actually have a forest. How did that happen? Because when two solvers solve their riddle close to each other, each one of them has the right to propose to the community a block, to propagate a block, and so somehow you have a fork, and then these forks can actually have further forks. 
However, how do we get a chain from this mess? Because if you continue working for a while, somehow the chain starts getting cleaner because all the confusion and um, ambiguity is pushed towards the edge. So, am I sure that this, um, the first block is stable by definition? And if I work a little bit more, maybe we ended up like this. It's not so clear that these blocks are stable, but the idea is that eventually they will become stable. It's a kind of a probabilistic process. So that essentially is the, the way um, Bitcoin uh, uh, works. So let me give you a summary. Somehow Bitcoin works by gossiping. So everybody wants to see as a transaction or see as a block. It just uh, tosses it to say 10 of his neighbor or her neighbors. And each one of them in turn send it to 10 of his or her neighbors and so on and so forth. And so then pretty soon in, in 10 hops you are going to reach pretty much everybody. And, but the analysis of the communication is actually very tricky. And so my uh, pass and shalat actually, according to my records, of all I know is the first uh, rigorous analysis of this. And um, of, um, um, how this way to, uh, to, why this works, why we, end, uh, we have a, a, a clean chain towards the end with the confusion only of, of, on the fringes. And again, I told you the main idea is consensus via proof of work. And the main assumption is that the ma honest majority of the mining computing power to solve these riddles, there are a specialized players called the miners and they to work a lot and, and uh, absorb a lot of energy, energy uh, electrical uh, uh, energy for their computation, and uh, the majority of this uh, computational power is in honest hand. Okay, so I wouldn't be here proposing a different architecture if they said no flaws. So let me tell you what I consider the main technical problems, and I'm not saying I, <laughs> I should say many of us consider technical uh, problems. The first one is wastefulness of electricity, cost, a whole bunch of other resources. We have been used to, uh, whenever we dig for gold, mind you that at the end, whenever we mine anything, we, we always have a big hole at the end of the process, and uh, so there is somewhat a uh, consuming uh, process. But the fact that uh, we have actually consumed a lot of uh, energy and work, and, w and we have a lot of waste uh, for uh, mining gold, doesn't mean that you know, we should have the same over here, so it, it, it doesn't follow. This wasteful, by the way, go back to it, you know, constrains the power, right, of how much. So, uh, mining a, a block, it could be up to $50,000 for one block, and every 10 minutes, you know, should this be the same rate uh, uh, all along, uh, is going to be, my arithmetic doesn't betray me, it should be 2 billion a year, so that's a lot of, of money. Maybe some blocks are cheaper than others, because of it, but, you know, that uh, not every application can afford so much investment of, uh, of resources. The second one is a rather more insidious, which is a, a new form of concentration of power. And this form is concentration of power in the hands of the people who are not really the owner of, uh, of the system. They are not the user who, who do transact in the system. These are the miners. And these miners actually somehow they f form pools so to be, uh, be rewarded and, uh, and working more efficiently because they also want to, <laughs> they want to be paid and they want to uh, make money because once you solve the riddle you are given a lot of money and so you organize yourselves in pools so to make sure that you get paid and you have a profitable and you get paid often enough. But it turns out that the five money pools can actually totally control what gets them to a block. So that is very disconcerting because we wanted a distributed ledger and we ended up somehow being in the hands of uh, just five mining pools. I find this very hard uh, to believe that say large financial institutions would like to push on a, a, a blockchain a few billion dollars uh, worth of, uh, of a new currency, and then some five miners, unaccountable to anybody, in faraway jurisdiction, can then decide whether they can spend their money or not. So it's like if I take a few billion dollars, I handcuff myself, 
lock it and then give the keys to a bunch of, of other people whom I don't even know and, no, and, and they are even unreachable by the long hand of the law. So that to me is a, a little bit of a, a concern and not only to me. And uh, there are some technology of uh, pass and she that somehow diminishes this problem, but a problem it is. By the way, uh, this actually is a, these miners are to me an exogenous uh, uh, point of vulnerability. So vulnerability comes with centralization. And the fact that actually this is uh, an exogenous <laughs> force make it easier, e e even harder. Because these miners, the system here can provide a little bit of some, uh, some privacy, pseudo privacy, right? You can change your key and you transfer money from one key of yours to another key of yours, pretending to be another. Maybe you get some privacy that way. However, the miners, everybody knows who they are. Why? Because wherever they are, they absorb so much of electricity that their, uh, their uh, electrical grids know where they are and their profit margins are actually quite low. And so you have a recipe for a disaster here. The other thing is that uh, scalability. So it may be even more miners uh, come along and then the riddle becomes you know, um, uh, 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 um, worse and worse to solve, more and more difficult, absorbing more and more resources. And so um, it's not clear if we can serve 10 million of users uh, actively transacting 100 million of users and so on and so forth. The other one is really ambiguity. If you remember, I was uh, talking about uh, these forks that eventually they get cleaned up. But once a fork gets cleaned up, some block may disappear. And your payment, the payment made to you appearing in that block may disappear too. Will it, ver will it be reappear in the future? Hard to say. Particularly if you want to put a bound whenever you want to put a payment, that this payment is either made in today or is never made, not to leave things lingering for a long, long time until finally they got in a, in a, in a, into a block whenever you no longer remember. So these are, the ambiguity of forks is really a problem. Particular, again, financial institutions, and they have already a lot of risk as it is, they don't need to have the additional risk that somehow a, a payment disappear. Just imagine a financial system in which a wire transfer suddenly vanishes. So um, it is good to have sometimes measures that allow certain transaction to be taken back, but it should not be the technology that forces this to happen. It should be a contractual relation between two parties who may actually agree that uh, we have a, they have a method or we have a method to somehow take back this transaction. It cannot be forced on us by our own technology. The technology is here to serve us. We are the citizens. We expect the best technology. The other thing is a long true latency because given that there may be forks, once up, you cannot rely on a block right away because this block, as we said, may disappear. So you may want to wait that it becomes six deep in the block to have some sense that you know you expect that this block is there to stay and all those transactions will be there forever. Maybe six is not enough and if you want to be more certain 12 or 24 but remember at 10 minutes a block so whenever you have uh, this uh, eventual consensus protocol in which you try to elongate the longest chain you are the true latency before you can actually guarantee that whatever is on a block will stay, you may wait hours rather than minutes. And this also constrains the applicability of the chain. In any case, even if we stop over here, and could be other things which are, are not exactly under many people's radar screens, but I'd like to be silent about it because it's enough to address already. So what, do we, what, would it, what I thought about saying, let's start from scratch with a different design. So Algorand is based on an effortless one-by-one -one Byzantine agreement. So again, let's try to uh, define effortless and one-by-one. -one. Here we go. Remember, the first block comes for free. It's part of the description of the system. The question is, how do we generate the new additional blocks? And you see here on the right of this block, there is a favor. 
a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. So in Inalgorand, as this favor gently falls down, then you have a bunch of uh, your chain appears. Okay? So, but wait a second. This is a clean chain. So what happens to forks? What happens to proof of work? There are no forks in Algorand, or there are no, no proof of work. So it is uh, the chain appears one at a time, the blocks exactly as uh, you imagine uh, it should happen. All right, let me now uh, focus on, uh, this is a very clean design, focus on the other Byzantine agreement. Byzantine agreement, uh, as the insightfully designed, defined by Peace, Shost uh, Shostak, and Lamport, is a communication protocol known since the 80s that has uh, the following um, uh, uh, great property. That if the majority of the player are honest, then he provides two fundamental guarantees, agreement and consistency. Let me tell you what agreement means. Agreement means that if the honest player start with the same, uh, 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 no matter what values the honest player start, at the end of this conversation, at the end of the protocol, everybody is going to agree on the same value. And so you can see that some owners are bad. I'll let you figure out which ones in the picture. Some are honest. And the honest one, they may start with different values, but at the end, they must uh, output each one of them the same value. You have this guarantee. And the second property that we have is that should the honest players start with the same value, then they will agree on that value no matter what. Okay? So agreement and consistency, both are actually uh, crucial. To have agreement without consistency is trivial. We can always say, with no discussion at all, we agree on zero. So we always be in agreement, but we have no meaningfulness at all. To be meaningful, we should say, if we start with the same value, we agree on that value. By the way, what is the relation between this, even at this stage, with what we are trying to do, the generation of a new block. Essentially, think of it that uh, what we want to agree on is what the new block is. So, at the end of this discussion, we are going to agree on a new block, and if everybody started with, uh, 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 thought of the block, the new block was the same, then we agree on that block. That is the connection. And it's going to play this role here. However, there are some challenges. Byzantine agreement is famous for being slow. I mean, uh, most applications so far uh, had 12 participants, right? So we are here on a scale, it cannot, uh, um, uh, way bigger than that. And moreover, the notion of a player in a Byzantine agreement is common knowledge. Everybody knows the set of players, it is fixed, and is known in advance. So in, uh, in a distributed ledger, people, uh, we envision a permissionless distributed ledger where new users can come in all along and certainly no, they are not fixed at all and even, know, even knows if we know who the, all the participants are. Okay, so that is the approach. Let's say as a summary, the communication is gossiping the same assumptions than before. The main idea is to have a message passing Byzantine agreement, the old fashioned Byzantine agreement and uh, the main assumption is that the majority of the money of the system is in honest hands. Okay, let's see what happens to those disadvantages in Algorand. We, now they become advantages. So first of all, the main advantage is that the computation involved is trivial. So what do you mean by trivial? A few additions, a comparisons of two integers, digitally sign one message, verify the signature of a few messages. Nothing to write home about. You don't need a supercomputer. You don't need an ISIC to do that type of stuff. Your laptop is plenty to end all of these things. Second of all, you have a, a true decentralization. You have a single class of users. No exogenous powers. No miners. There is only us, the users. We are in charge of the whole system. But we don't rely on a different class to help us conduct our business. We are the only citizens of this country responsible for our own action, unaided by every, anyone, and certainly not controlled by any, anyone. The third is finality of payments. What does this mean? That is a very important uh, uh, property of any financial system. 
we remember that the finality of payment in Bitcoin was threatened by the presence of a fork, then means that some block disappears. In, 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 in Algorand, there are no forks, and therefore, as soon as a block appears, you can rely on it, and whatever payment appears on it is going to be, is paid and is going to last forever. I'm actually exaggerating here, because there is a negligible probability of having a fork in Algorand. How, what is the probability? The probability I chose it to be 10 to the minus 18. That's a strange number. Well, let me tell you what 10 to the 18, to the power 18 is. It is the number of seconds from the Big Bang until now. So, if we produce a block a second, which would be a very good clip, we have to wait for the lifetime of the universe to see a fork. And under this, we can actually perhaps, you know, rest in peace. And by the way, if there is a fork, then we can solve it in 10 minutes, but somehow the fact that we to wait the life of the universe, uh, sure, is good, the frosting on the cake, that we can solve it quickly, but, uh, but in, in some sense it never happens. It's not of a, of a human concern. The other thing is that the system enjoys a perfect scalability. Let me tell you what it is. In a system in which we want the blocks to appear one at a time and, uh, and, and they are actually chained in a sequence, we cannot produce a block faster that we can actually propagate it to the network. Remember, that is a distributed system. So the way we know a block is by tossing it to each other until it reaches all of us. So this speed necessary for a block to reach everybody really is the only bottleneck in algorithm. In Bitcoin, there was an additional bottleneck, which is the interval between, that you ex wanted to have between one riddle solution and the other. We said the 10 minutes. Well, couldn't we do it to one minute in Bitcoin? One minute is faster than 10 minutes. Yes, but then the possibility when if you weaken the riddle and shooting for one winner a minute, Suddenly, the number of forks increases dramatically because of many more people, by chance now, they are going to solve it very close to each other. So we don't have here, so Bitcoin has two bottlenecks. One is how fast you can move around the block. This is not really the problem. But then there's other exogenous, uh, due to the peculiarity of, of Bitcoin um, um, bottleneck. In, uh, in Algorand, the bottleneck is that of propagating the block, period. And finally, there is a question of security, and in fact, the proof of security against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. So, but fear not, here we are to protect you. So let me tell you briefly what is the adversary that uh, Algorand can withstand. He is an adversary who can immediately corrupt anybody he wants Anytime he wants, provided, say, that it does not corrupt, say, more than n over, than, uh, n over 3 of the internet, which would be hard to do anyway. So he points, I want you to work for me, I want you to work for me, done. No time to wait, to, to, please click on this link. He does it immediately. And by the way, after he corrupts you know, uh, possibly thousands and millions of people, he can organize them perfectly to work for them. They become zombie that he can orchestrate and let them do whatever he wants. The only thing he cannot do is to forge digital signatures, which, by the way, if a digital signature scheme is properly chosen, not even a national state can do, so nothing to worry about. Do I need to be so adversarial? So I am a cryptographer, and my friend tells me that I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic. I keep on pushing back that I'm very realistic if we are going to have a distributed ledger that the entire humanity relies on to conduct its own business, this is going to be trillions of dollars uh, worth, in no, no matter what, whether it's money or um, titles or, or whatever we want to organize our life. And if we have such a juicy target, don't, if we think that a well-determined um, adversary is not going to materialize, we are just fooling ourselves. So the answer is absolutely yes. All right, so let me share you at least a bit of the architecture of Algorand. I'm going to simplify it, and in fact, actually, <laughs> that is a pretty um, uh, a simplification already, as the picture shows. Let me tell you what happens at the highest level. 
So let's assume that these are the millions and millions and millions, possibly billions of users in Algorand, because it scales, so we should be able to handle it. And by the way, no surprise to everybody, some of these uh, people are honest, users are honest, and, uh, and some are dishonest, but the dishonest are in a minority. By the way, I do believe that the majority of society is formed of honest people, and I can even prove it. Proof. Societies exist, end of proof. So if in a society in which everybody steals, everybody murders, the judges you know, send away, uh, um, um, lock up the innocent and free the criminals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this is a jungle, there is not really a society. So are there bad, uh, bad people in society? Absolutely, but maybe there are 1%, 5%, 10%, you know. <laughs> I want to ruin myself, 20%, but it's not going to, if it, everybody else, there is no society, so no, nothing to worry about. So as you can see, we are in a minority here. Okay, Algorand is, works in two, let me describe it at the highest level, as two magical phases. What happens in phase one? Out of all these users, one user, in this case, happens to be honest, as the picture indicates, is chosen at random. And his or her identity becomes immediately known to the entire network by magic. What is this randomly selected user going to do? He's going to assemble a new block. He sees, you know, what, trans what he knows what the blocks or transactions are up to now. He sees what the new legitimate transaction, valid transactions are. He forms a new block and then propagates it. That's the end of phase one. Magic phase two. A thousand users are now again randomly selected as a, a small committee. And their name is immediately known by everybody in the network. And what do these people do, this committee does? They run Byzantine agreement on the block proposed by the first person. So each one of them has received a version of the block from the, pre, uh, from the initially selected user. If the user is honest, everybody receives the same block. If the user is dishonest, he may send different block to different people to, uh, to cause confusion. But remember, the Byzantine agreement is such that that doesn't matter because at the end, we are all going to agree on the same block and when the user was honest, that is that block that originally proposed. And if it was dishonest of a proposer, then we can agree on the empty block to say, well, no transaction for this time, Clearly, he was a, a bad proposer. Let's move on to the next block. So, they run Byzantine agreement, which say, call them a thousand people. And then each one somehow notices his own output, says, and as the guarantee that whatever, even though I'm locally in my computer seeing this block, I have a guarantee that all the other honest people see the same block that I, that I see. So what I do, I digitally sign the ash of a block, and propagate it into the network. So if you are a user who this time was not happened to be drafted in the committee, but you see one block that has the signature of, say, 750 of the committee members, you know who the committee members are for this block, you know that uh, uh, there are, uh, 750 have signed this block, you are sure mathematically essentially sure that this is the right block. Why? Because if there is, say, if 90% of the people are honest, or even 80% of the people is honest, there is, with overwhelming probability, the majority of 1,000 randomly selected committee is going to be honest. That's it. Okay, again, two phases. One random user is selected, his identity is known and proposes a block, a thousand users are randomly selected, their, ident their identity is magically known immediately to the community, and they approve the block proposed by the first person. Okay, at, at this highest level, it's clear that there is going to be a lot of, of questions. And uh, here I'm going to, uh, by presenting these ideas uh, um, 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 various times, I somehow selected the three most popular questions and answer those. There are, of course, more questions, but will be answered uh, uh, on another time or on a one-to-one -one basis. 
And by the way, we, have, we better start taking rabbits out of a hat now, because if we do things the way we are expected to be doing, we would have the same design as everybody else. So we are going to do uh, something a little bit uh, uh, outside of the, uh, the, the beaten trail. The first question that I find is very reasonable. Who selects the committee? Because the committee has a lot of power. They approve a block. And the answer that Algorand gives to this question is rather counterintuitive. Each committee member secretly selects himself. Says, gee, this is the worst idea I've ever seen. Why? Because if I can select myself, I want to select myself to be part of this committee and the next and the one after this forever. But not so fast. The way a committee is selected is by running in his own computer, his own or her own individual lottery, and that is a cryptographic lottery that guarantees you cannot cheat, no matter, even if you are a national state trying to cheat. But if you win this lottery, you have a proof, which is a winning ticket, that you can show everybody, and everybody will be convinced, oh, you are in the committee for this particular block. Okay? So think about this. Assume we have a million people, and we want a committee of roughly, say, a thousand people. So each one self-selects him or herself with probability one in a thousand. A million divided by a thousand, you expect to have a thousand people come back on me. If there are 100 million users, each one of us selects him or herself with probability one in 100,000, and if you win, you have a ticket. And so what do you do with this ticket? Remember, you wanted to approve the block, so you send your ticket convincing the entire world that they better pay attention to your opinion because you are a member of the committee, and your message, which is your opinion about the quality of the block, should the block be adopted or not, essentially, right? That is the, that is the idea. And notice that this process is extremely quick, right? Because remember, finding agreement is very hard. What is the problem of our distributor ledger? Agreeing on the next block. What Algorand does, first we agree on a committee, and then the committee agrees on the block. So, so gee, but agreeing on the committee should be as hard as agreeing on anything, including the block. Not true, because here, the committees, people self-select themselves, right? That is the idea. By the way, you may also want to know that the probability of your being selected for the committee is proportional to the entire money you own in the system. Why is that? Because otherwise I can pretend to be a thousand people, a million people, so that I get selected, you know, in one, one of my versions, one of my clones is going to be selected. But assume that I own a hundred thousand dollars in the, in the uh, system, I can put everything under one key and, be, and having a chance of being selected that way, or I can create 100,000 keys, each one of them owning one dollar. But my probability to end up in the committee is the same. That's what is guaranteed by Algorand, okay? That's why I say if Algorand works if the majority of the money is in honest hands. All right, second question. G, but okay, 1,000 people is better than 100 million, but uh, didn't you say that the Byzantine agreement was indeed very slow? That we were running for application with 12 people? So a thousand people is, seems to be a lot. Well, again, the answer of Algorand is that Algorand provides a new and super fast Byzantine agreement algorithm. Okay, define how fast it is. Well, if a block proposer is honest, in four steps, this, pro this discussion is over. And if the block proposer is dishonest and didn't say, in the worst case, tries to confuse people, in the worst case, in expected nine steps, you are, your discussion is over and you have reached agreement anyway. Okay, nine steps, four steps, not so bad. But what happens in a step? Because if in a step I have to move a boulder up a mountain, you know, nine steps is too many. Nothing to worry about because in a step, 
if you are a member of the committee, what you have to do is a very simple thing. You have to propagate to the network a single and very short messages. So can we afford a thousand people, each of which this, uh, sends a short uh, uh, message? Yes, we can. Proof, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We are done, okay? How bad can it be? Next and final question, and you say, wait a second. So you yourself said that we had to be prepared for the worst because the worst will happen, or at least it will be attempted against the system. You have this adversary, which can corrupt anybody as soon as, uh, as he wants. So if you have a thousand people committee, it's no problem for this adversary to corrupt them all. Perhaps he cannot corrupt you know, a third of the internet, but certainly could corrupt a thousand people. And moreover, you say you can corrupt them instantaneously. And the answer is here that we are going to have, because it's so simple and so quick to select a committee, requires no discussion, no communication, and it's so damn quick that we elect a committee for each step. So let me tell you why this is good. I am the adversary here now. So what happens is that I'd love to corrupt the committee. Problem is that I don't know who the committee, who the committee members are because you have the, your winning ticket by running the lottery in your own computer. So I would be binocular, look at the entire humanity and say, so who is the committee? I do not know. Suddenly, the people who have the winning ticket, a thousand of them, they propagate their, their winning ticket and they propagate their message. At this point, I know who they are. I can, yes, corrupt them. But you know what? At this point, it's too late to corrupt them. Why? Because whatever they had to say, they've already said. They are not going to participate. They might or may not participate in another step. So I cannot put back in the bottle whatever they said, their message they're propagating, no more than the US government can put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. That is the same concept. Okay, so I elect a committee for each step. There are at most nine steps. Big deal, we are done very, very quickly and very, very securely because not even this adversary can do anything about it. Because each committee member speaks once by propagating his winning ticket and, uh, uh, and his step X message for whatever step X has been selected for. Okay, now I want to play a little bit the devil advocate. So let me tell you, this is nonsense. Why is nonsense? Because, so what is a protocol, in particular a Byzantine protocol? A, a protocol is an intelligent discussion that should guarantee certain properties. In our case, consistency and agreement. But can you imagine a discussion that occurs over a few steps, four or nine, in which a thousand people show up they say something, but now comes an adversary, machine guns all of them, all dead. No problem, because we've done step one. And step two, who does it? Oh, a new thousand people show up, unrelated to the first 1,000, and they say a message in their proof, the adversary comes and kills all of them. No problem. Another 1,000 are selected, they are killed, and so on and so forth. A bit bloody. But what can they say? What type of intelligent conversation can they, these people have? Right? Seems to me that they cannot do much at all. So, so here is something that they could do, for instance. Assume that a thousand people come up and the only thing they had to do is to announce a random number between one and a hundred. So a thousand people show up, somebody says 73, 27, and then they're all killed. Another one thousand people show up and then they say uh, 48, uh, uh, 21, and so on and so forth. They're killed, and so on and so forth. In this particular thing, do we care if it's the same 1,000 people who announce this random number at every step, or it is a different 1,000 people each time? No, because we are giving random junk. So anybody can give random junk. There is no need to be the same. But, we are, but this protocol doesn't do anything smart at all, right? So the problem is that maybe this 
is nonsense when the protocol is actually has to be have a very specific uh, um, guarantee. Well, not really, because this protocol, the new super fast Byzantine agreement, not only super fast, but has another very attractive property that I'd like to term player replaceability, which means it works even though different players unrelated execute the different steps. And by the way, that is a brand new property. And after a few decades in this business, I never thought this property to be possible. So I was the first one to be, to be mystified that actually this happened. So, and I'd like therefore to show you that at least in principle by a metaphor to show that there is something with some goals that we can achieve and here we go. Okay. We are towards the end of the talk, right? And uh, the adversary has been very active and is in very strongly en entrenched positions. And we've been fighting very valiantly against the adversary. Our flag is stuttered, but it still proudly flies. What we are going to do now, like in battles of the old, we are going to carry our colors across the field and clear the field for the enemy. In so doing, we shall suffer some heavy casualty. But if some of us falls, somebody else will pick up the flags from our hand and carry it forward. Ready? Protocol, charge! Victory, we won. Okay, so essentially think of it like a process of carrying the flag. You notice that initially um, 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 some people of the blue players, the red player, the green player alternates in carrying the flag. They are not the same people, but did we care? No, we got our victory anyway. What is the relationship between these players? No relationship whatsoever. They are absolutely different players. Moreover, because they are selected each step by a random lottery, they can be in different numbers. Sometimes it can be not a thousand, but 1,200. Sometimes it can be 950. Who cares? And they have no shared variables either. It's not that before I pass the baton to somebody else because I don't even know to whom I'm going to pass the baton. But we have a shared environment. And this allows us to somehow act as if we were a single set of players from beginning to end. That's why the, the, the protocol is not only very, very fast, but also very, very secure because we don't have anybody to stay in power as a target to the adversary at all. Totally unpredictable, and next one is totally unpredictable, and once you see who they are, you may as well corrupt, it doesn't matter. So that essentially is Algorand. I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, many people, Sergei Gorbanov, of whom I had the initial idea, and, uh, and my colleague uh, Vinod for, uh, for uh, uh, making the VBA protocol uh, uh, in, to work with a simple majority, um, uh, Professor Jin Chen uh, for um, writing the, uh, the, the mathematical uh, proof part of this uh, um, uh, protocol, and Yossi um, Gilad, uh, Rotem Emo, Yorgos Avlakos, and Nikolai Zeldovic for uh, test, uh, doing a test implementation algorithm and uh, making sure that not only it works mathematically, but actually does scales as as that. All right, I'd like, however, to somehow uh, discuss briefly some related technologies. In my opinion, Algorand is the pure proof of stake system, pure in the platonic sense, so the, really the ideal of what a proof of stake ought to be. By the way, it is not, however, a delegated proof of stake. A delegated proof of stake has nothing to do with algorithm. A delegated proof of stake means I'm going to put in charge a few people for a while, say for a month, say let them, uh, for efficiency reasons, deal with blocks uh, selection and things. That, to me, is another form of centralization. Before we had the miners, now we had the, visa, the, the delegates. Not good. Why is not good? Also, in particular, because an adversary could attack them. It can, that is not a good idea. The second proof of stake uh, is a money in the middle proof of stake, meaning I'm going to take some of my money and I push in the middle of the table where I cannot touch it, and some people may follow suit, and among all the people who, who do so like me, 
uh, proportionate to whatever they put on the middle of, 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 of the table, they are given authority to decide the blocks. First of all, I want to say that to actually achieve this property is a little bit harder than it seems. But second and more importantly, the target of this money in the middle proof of stake, I don't believe is, is a good target. Actually, it may be a dangerous target. So let me ask each uh, uh, and every one of you, what percentage of your own money can you put aside and never touch, not invest it, leave it there, okay? Very, very small. So the honest people, you know, they're going to contribute, push very minimal, because most people live on salaries and at the end of the month they spend everything that they, 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 at the beginning of the month. So the danger is that actually we are going to make it easy for big thieves with big pockets to push a lot of the money. They are going to be the one who are going to put a lot of the money in the table for the purpose of controlling the network. But now you can say, but if they misbehave, we confiscate their money. Sure, but see, they care. If I put a million dollars in the table when other, everybody else puts a few dollars, and I misbehave and I get my million dollars confiscated, if I'm making a billion dollars on the side, who cares? This is cost of doing business. So these are all forms, essentially, hidden forms of, of centralization. And the, the message really is, it is really hard to be truly decentralized. And um, which I believe Algorand really is. It is the true decentralized system, all through, without any discounts or exceptions. Let me mention there are uh, um, other um, uh, approaches, uh, um, Ouroboros, that has, uh, also avoids the proof of work, and as uh, these committees that somehow self-refresh themselves by electing uh, also as part of their business the next committee and they slowly migrate to, from one committee to the other, but they to remain in power for a long time, so an epoch, so uh, a few a thousand rounds this way, and, um, but again, they do eventual consensus and therefore longer time to confirmation and so on and so forth. There is a sleepy consensus, very elegant approach, no proof of work, um, very crisp proofs, and, uh, but again, at the end, is an eventual consensus and therefore a long time to confirmation too, and so on and so forth. So let me um, summarize argument. So Algorand. Algorand has no forks, no miners, no proof of work, no way to confirmation. You, all payments are final, and you can rely on a block as soon as you see them. And there are only us, the citizens, period. Nobody else, uh, we don't need anyone else to run our own affairs. The computation involved is trivial, and the scalability is perfect, and the security is great. There are also additional properties that I'd like to share with you without even just mentioning them, because we don't have the time. And one is, uh, Algorand is actually very fast, but it's even faster if you allow some rare forks. Not one in the in, in age of the universe, but say, how about a fork uh, once in 10 years? You know, a fork once in 10 years, if you can resolve it in 10 minutes and you can speed up everything, worth the trade. As actually secure incentives, uh, we can work without incentives. Why? I mean, Bitcoin cannot work without incentives because the mining job is really very expensive. So you must uh, compensate people for their expenses and maybe give them a little bit of a profit. But in Algorand, because there are no efforts whatsoever, you can afford not to pay anybody, but if you really want to be nice to pay somebody very little because there is nothing to compensate for, but yet it's important to orchestrate these incentives so as to be secure. Because very often, whenever you offer incentive, you want to incentivize one behavior and you obtain a totally different behavior. Incentives can actually be runaway trains, and in my opinion, it was a runaway train the a rising of miners and their power in Bitcoin and similar systems. It actually has security against arbitrary partitions where the, uh, the adversary in the network can decide somehow for a longer period of time who, the, who receives what message and when, and somebody should never receive a message, can isolate players, can do anything he wants for, uh, for long stretches of time. Algon still works in this model anyway. And one thing which I believe it is very important 
is as a flexible governance model without hard forks. So let me tell you what I mean by this, because I believe that this will be important uh, for uh, uh, the distributed ledgers uh, that uh, we really want. I believe that no battle plans survives the first shot. You can, on, on the table, you say the infantry goes here, the cannons, the artillery goes the other way, but you know, then it rains, then the, there is too much mud in the hill for the industry to go up, uh, and now you're stuck with the original plan. It doesn't work that way. So a cryptocurrency, um, um, most cryptocurrency are really ocean liners on automatic pilot. But the condition at sea changes, all kinds of sea changes, but the pilot doesn't change. And, so, and if you want to change it, now you are causing a rupture of the cryptocurrency, yet to cause what is called an hard fork. And, uh, and you are lucky if there is a big chunk and a smaller chunk that is divided, because I would love to be on the bigger chunk. But now, remember that in Algorand, instead of this problem of governance, is very easy. Why? Because remember, we have a magic way to select a thousand people are random, in representation of everybody, proportionally to whatever uh, the money in the system, for free. And these people can decide on anything. They can decide what the next block is going to be, they can agree on what the next block is going to be, or they can agree on some change of rules. So in other words, what do you do? I want to propose a change of rules because time has changed and an algorithm should improve. I propose to have uh, this committee formed on day X, and their deliberation to be adopted on, on day Y. So once you know where really the majority of the system is, you'll be somehow irrational not to follow suit later on when it really is going to be taking place. In other words, you can actually have a, a rules in which by statute you need the 60% of the votes to change, some other rules 75% of the votes, but we do have the possibility of a flexible governance. Even we do have a very proud of our constitution, but we have some ways with very high uh, thresholds to change, to make amendments to the constitution. And we have actually amended from time to time. And I cannot imagine of a, a distributed ledger to be immutable forever. There are other things, but I'd like to proceed to conclusion. I'd like to leave you with this image. This is the Julian Bridge in southern France. It was actually erected in 3 BC. So it has been in continual operation for 2,020 years by now. And until 2005, cars were allowed to cross the bridge across. Unbelievable piece of infrastructure. So they, this piece of infrastructure not only was extremely useful, but actually was a, a piece of art. And I believe that the distributed ledger is going to be as useful to cement and bridge us together and is going to be as beautiful as any physical infrastructure that uh, we have ever built, if we build it correctly. So let's build the correct distributed ledger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvio, for operating under such extreme circumstances. Uh, you know, we, we deal with it, a very technological world and what you have at the platform hiccups uh, oh. uh, prior to, as, as you're doing your uh, presentation. So again, uh, it speaks to you, Silvio, that you were able to adjust uh, in real time to give a, a description of this uh, marvelous uh, technology that you created. There's, a, there's, there's been a number of questions from the audience and very much ties in with this idea uh, Silvio, so and that is, what is the status of algorithm now, uh, Algorand now in terms of its continued development? Well, you know, first of all, I must say um, uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, two papers on Algorand. One is uh, a, a, a theory paper with proofs and everything that I co-authored uh, with uh, Jing Chen and is available on the web uh, in uh, the arch archive. And um, there is another uh, paper, which is a, a system uh, paper that uh, is uh, with uh, uh, Yossi Gilad, Rotem Emo, uh, Georgios Vlakos, uh, and uh, Nikolai Zeldovich that uh, essentially tests uh, Algorand and, um, and actually confirms uh, whatever the, the theory says. And this paper 
is going to be available too, and in fact, it's going to appear at the end of the month at the SOSP conference, which this year will happen to be in, uh, in Shanghai. So, um, uh, and uh, that, that is the status of the paper. Let me tell you that I con will continue to improve uh, on, the, on the theory. In fact, actually, I'm going to, the basic structure doesn't change, but I found a lot of directions that uh, should be uh, considered and distributed ledger that for some strange reasons have not actually entered uh, everyone the header screens, but, um, uh, but they eventually will. And once they rise to consciousness, everybody will want them. And so I'm, I'm already in, uh, taking a head start uh, and solving uh, these other additional problems uh, as well. Silvio, you know, you, you've uh, got a, 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 you know, historical sort of standing in cryptography in areas, uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs and so on. And can you describe your journey that turned your attention to Bitcoin and distributed ledger? All right. So um, as I have a journey as a two component, a psychological one and a technical one. Right. So let me start with a, a, how it happens uh, psychologically. So I, I was uh, taking a break from my decade-old interest uh, in cryptography. Uh, I was working on uh, incentive design, essentially new auctions and new game theoretic mechanisms. And uh, as you can imagine, Bitcoin was mentioned often enough, but I resisted the temptation of having a look. Uh, I am uh, proudly a monomaniac, okay? I pursue one thing at a time for a long time. However, in a moment of weakness, I actually <laughs> succumbed and learned about Bitcoin. And I was struck by the vision and, and the geniality of the design. And I thought that Nakamoto's idea was really great, but also one that screamed for improvement. So I said, you know, how would I do it? And so I started my algorithm uh, journey. Uh, and by now, I'm maniacally devoted to Algorand, and so I will for a long time. So, in some sense, my internal laws uh, and order have been restored. And now, from the uh, techni technicality, what jumped to me right away was uh, somehow the, the, the hidden notion of a, a Byzantine agreement, right? And Byzantine agreement is a very strong concept. A guy that, as I mentioned, to invented by Leslie Lamport and others, and uh, I know less. I'm a big admirer of his work. So, and I'm, and I'm in a great company for for better, by the way. And so, all of a sudden, I knew about Byzantine Agreement. In fact, I was passionate about it already in the 80s. I published my first Byzantine Agreement protocol in 1985. I granted my my first PhD on the very subject of, of Byzantine Agreement. So, you know, there are a few advantages of having been around for a while. <laughs> and so and this is one that you actually see a lot of these, uh, these uh, concepts. So when I saw Bitcoin, I realized that the best way to generate a new block was to reach Byzantine agreement on it. But Nakamoto never explicitly says, uh, look, ideally, I would like to use Byzantine agreement to reach consensus on a block, but I can't. All Byzantine agreement protocols are help hopelessly this law at the scale I need. Indeed, in some sense, as painful and wasteful as reaching eventual consensus on a new block we are proof of work may be, is just a, a walk in the park uh, with respect to running Byzantine agreement with the numbers of players uh, and the not network uh, that we have at, at hand in a cryptocurrency. In, in prior practical application, people actually run uh, Byzantine agreement with 12 players at the most. So uh, no surprise, therefore, um, the people opt all the time for much weaker versions of, of uh, Byzantine agreement. And Nakamoto's uh, eventual consensus is just one, but so is practical Byzantine for tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they, are, they rely on more optimistic scenario rather than adversarial one. So I decided to pick up the challenge of, of reaching the original notion of Byzantine agreement without any weakening and without any hidden discount, but much faster and more, more scalable than before. Uh, I knew it was a challenge, but A, I like challenges, and, uh, and I eventually succeeded by a three-stage approach. One, be prepared. 
two there, and third, get lucky. And frankly, the first two stages help, but the first is always the crucial one. And uh, I got lucky. And nothing to be ashamed about it, I, because nothing is accomplished without luck anyway. You know, Silvio, you, you, you given the name to this system that you developed, which is uh, improves on scalability, it's more reliable, doesn't have the power issues of, of Bitcoin. How did you come up with that name, Algorand? Well, Stephen, remember, I'm a cryptographer, right? And uh, nothing is more private than the choice of your own name. As you see now, I am monumentally fusing myself with Algorand okay, at the moment. And nothing is more sacred than privacy with a capital P. So let me say that Algorand is a name of fantasy and a vocation for, for people to explore. You know, some people uh, find all kinds of things in it. Some find the gold it, uh, hidden in the name. Others find grand, etc., etc. You know what? They're all right. To me, Algorand is a mythical place where the good and the seemingly impossible are made real by the magic of mathematics. And overall, what do you see the benefits in sort of a more general uh, question about the benefits for blockchain and its applications? Well, all right. So, of course, you know, uh, endowing society with greater transparency is a huge gift, right? It's a great benefit. Distributed ledgers will help curb corruption, enable payments with much less risk, uh, enable loans uh, with lower interest rates, uh, and on and on. But as big as these advantages are, in my opinion, they pale relative to the common trust that they provide and actually let us leverage. The real advantage are really the contracts, not necessarily the very smart contracts, but even the dumb contract that they enable. And this is really where the value of the ledger is. We are going to give the world with a host of financial and uh, services and other services that are secure, fast, and cheap. And we will transact much more and much more securely and conveniently than before. So, but right now, smart contracts are too expensive, computationally and otherwise, and we must uh, uh, work to better the situation. And this is what I'm doing right now, by the way. You know, uh, you've made improvements, as I mentioned, in scalability, reliability, and power requirements, and so on. Do, do you have some uh, data uh, behind that as well, like how Algram improves on scalability, reliability, and power requirements? Actually, yes, in the SOSP paper that I was mentioning before, we actually tested for scalability. We didn't try to optimize you know, for block production, but we really wanted to see whether by, by chance there were some hidden uh, uh, grandiness that, that stopped Algorand for scale. So what we did is that you know, we rented a uh, thousand servers from Amazon and uh, we simulated uh, the system with uh, 10,000 users, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, up to 500,000. We wanted to test it actually up to a million users, but we didn't, never found the 2,000 uh, servers from Amazon to be simultaneously available. But in any case, this um, uh, things went really according uh, as predicted by the theory. So somehow after 75,000, uh, no, uh, no matter how many other users you, you add, um, the extra work remain uh, very flat. So, um, so which is in some sense is, uh, uh, is to be expected. So let's say, uh, uh, again, we wanted to test whether what happens asymptotically to this curve, but, uh, but the numbers uh, also without trying much to optimize are not so bad. So, we generate a, a two mega block rather than one mega block in uh, something like uh, 17 seconds. So not not bad, uh, um, um, but uh, but again, you know, without even uh, trying to um, uh, to improve uh, things much. And, but of course, however, once you have a block, as you know, you can further uh, uh, by off chain uh, all kinds of uh, things. You can uh, transform, you know, thousands of transactions into millions. So, but I'm, I'm saying I'm not even counting these other things. I'm just looking at uh, the, the ledger itself. How fast can you produce a block? And moreover, remember that once a block is produced, because uh, it doesn't disappear, uh, that is uh, is as good as money in the bank. You can rely on it right away. 
this um, question is somewhat controversial. You know, there's there's this things called initial coin offerings, or some are now saying perhaps initial token offerings, ITOs, ICOs, um, in terms of raising funds and so on. Uh, Sylvia, since you're in the middle of all of this and you, and you are uh, really one of the leading lights in terms of developments in this area, what are your thoughts on ICOs or ITOs, that is initial coin offerings? Oh, uh, well, all right, so I'm uh, happy to share uh, my uh, personal views. Look, I believe that ICOs are, are a very attractive ways to finance and launch new cryptocurrencies, okay? But they are also very much misunderstood and sometimes uh, cross the boundaries of legality, which is a real pity. Because I do not subscribe to the notion that the law should not apply to cyberspace and cryptocurrencies in particular nor that it should be circumvented if technology lets you do it. I believe that the law is everywhere and that is here to stay really. And, and that actually is a win-win both for individual and society. Yes, more clarity is needed and the law must keep up with fast change, okay? But we should all endeavor not only so as to comply with the law, but also to make it easy to comply with the law. We should all endeavor so that the ICOs are conducting a law-abiding matter and raise the money necessary to bring about much-needed technology and bliss uh, to the world we live in. Thank you, Silvio, for, for uh, sharing your thoughts on that uh, interesting question. You know, we're, we're out of time today, and, and Silvio, I, I, again, do appreciate that uh, you continued under sort of very difficult circumstances with the platform not allowing the slide advance, and yet you uh, were able to be agile in real time. And my apologies to the audience, uh, and the ACM will be looking into um, the provider uh, to see what the issues are in terms of the slide advance and so on. So anyway, so we run out of time, and I, I would very much like to thank Silva McKelly again for his informative uh, discussion and insightful answers to the questions and a special thanks to each of you for your patience uh, during this time and taking the time to attend and participate today. Now this webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org forward slash webinar and you'll find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, which you should see on your screen. On, on behalf of ACM, Silva McKelly and myself, Stephen Ibaraki, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. This concludes the webinar.